I'm so thankful we have the best worship team in the world. Can you give them a big hand? Just say thank you for all you're doing. I want to welcome everybody who's watching online. Great to have you with us. Thanks for joining us. And uh, I know you're going to be blessed by this message. And also, I'm sure the uh, worship has already been a blessing to you. It's fantastic. Every week we're here. You can take that further back. Just, just take it a bit further back. Thank you. Uh, got a couple of things I want to draw a few pictures, you know, fiddle around. Wonderful. Who's here for the first time again? I just wanted to see your hand and uh, welcome you. God bless you. So good to have you here. God bless you. So good to have you here. All these visitors. Yeah, give them a, yeah, great to see you here. So good. Yeah, make sure you get that bag uh, that we want to give you and uh, make sure you get that free cup of coffee and uh, we'd love to stay in touch with you. Well, we're in a series called Faith and uh, I've done the, this week and uh, last week uh, introducing, I love preaching about faith. I could actually do a series for a year on this topic because uh, I, I so love doing it and I think our world so needs it. And uh, we live in a Thomas generation and to get faith into people's heart, an injection of faith in their spirit is so important. And next week, my wife, Chris Pringle, is going to be preaching on faith uh, here as well, which is awesome getting ready for the women's conference in the town hall in just two, three, two and a half weeks' time. That's going to be an amazing time with Leanne Matesius, Holly Wagner, and uh, a few others. Thank you, Jesus. Good to have Mark and Bernadette Kelsey back in the house. Welcome them back. They've been overseas, traveling around. And one of our most favorite members, Paul Mackin. Good to see you back in the house, brother. He went away with his family on a holiday. He's come back on his own. What's that tell you? Uh, yeah. There you go. Good to see you, brother. I'll find out later what's happening. Hebrews 11.8, people. Uh, this is uh, one of two uh, messages I'm bringing this weekend. The different one in the chapel service. And this is, I'm doing this one now, and I'll be doing a different one tonight in the same series, same theme. Because, as I said, there is so many areas we can uh, cover on this, on this topic. Hebrews 11 verse 8, it says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Okay, let's have, let's have a look at the, the command in Genesis 12 verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abraham, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. That was, that was the word of the Lord. And he went out not knowing where he was going. It takes faith to be obedient. When God says, I want you to do this, don't think that it's going to be something that is easy for your faith. It's going to take faith to conquer giants in your promised land. It's going to take faith to walk around a, a walled city and shout at walls. Please, that's going to take faith when you're feeling so stupid doing what you're doing uh, and, and yet God says, this is how it's going to happen. You might even feel stupid like taking a lump of clay and putting it in a blind man's eye, but that's what Jesus did with, with people. It take, he heard the Holy Spirit say, put some mud in his eye. And you go like, what? Or nudges you and says, give that to the person you don't like, you know? Like our campus pastor struggling with obedience, you know, but eventually he got there and happily he did it. And this is what Abraham had to do. He had to go from the known to the unknown. And that is what faith will help you do. He had to do, go from what he could see to what he could not see, to what he was blind to. He had to go from the familiar to the unfamiliar. And that's the only way that you get into a new day. That's the only way you're going to find yourself having a changed life. Most of us want to have changes on the outside without having any changes on the inside. But if you want a changed life, you've got to change. Surprise, surprise. Uh, it's an amazing thought, isn't it? You mean, if, I, if I'm going to change, I need to change? Yeah. And change is challenging for a lot of us because God is going to say, I want you to go from the known to the unknown. Go out to a land that I will show you. You're going to be okay. God assures you, you're going to be all right. I will show it to you, but just start walking, taking steps. I want you to take steps of faith, believing that I am going to be with you. Now, 
It wasn't easy for Abraham at the age of 75. You're more like down at the, down at the funeral home choosing a coffin, you know. It's like you're, you're kind of writing up your will. You're getting ready to, you know, check out and say, well, another 10 years, maybe 15, uh, you know, but uh, I'm going to settle up and start wandering on the beach. And No, you're not doing that, are you? <laughs> no. I, I'm sorry to offend anybody here. I don't attempt to or mean to, but, uh, you know, I know that as you get older, it's like, you get a little more nervous about the end of life. Well, in in that nervous time, God says to Abraham, look, I want you to move from the secure to the insecure. I want you to go to a place where you 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 haven't got no security. You haven't got any friends. You haven't got any family. You haven't got any house. You haven't got any. He's telling him to go out there. So this is, and this is called our father of faith. Telling us to take this journey, which is take a step. Now, I know many times we hear we get a breakthrough or we need to take a step. I want to talk about not just taking a step, but taking steps, which we've got up here, steps of faith, because then it becomes a walk. One step after another. When you take steps of faith, not just a step of faith, you gave in a vision builder's offering or you took a step of faith and you gave something or you did something or you got involved in something. But how about a lifestyle where you are walking in faith? Now, for you, you may not have joined a connect group and it's the unknown for you. Who would be there? What would I do? What would I? Well, it's a step. We call them next step. What's your next step to keep you growing in the kingdom of God? Not just being in the same place every week of your life, but actually growing, becoming a bigger person. You might be in a connect group But sometimes you thought, what would it be like leading one? It's the unknown. It's the thing you can't see. It's unfamiliar to you. It's a world of insecurity. But God God could be nudging you, say, do some connect leader training. You might not be a tithe, you might might not be tithing each week, giving a tenth of your income. It's you've got the known budget in front of you. But to go out there, maybe that's a step. But then it's not just a step for one week, it's steps for the rest of your life. It becomes a walk of tithing, and every week you're exercising your faith, and you're moving from what you can see, and you're moving from the familiar, you're moving from the secure into the insecure. Some of you here today should take home a new member, or a new friend, to, or a, a, a person you've never met before. Take them out for lunch. You know, it's like, yeah, but, but we normally go to this restaurant with these friends, and we do this every week, and on Thursday night, I do this with them, and then on Monday night, I do this with them, and we, we, we've got our little circle of four people and our dog, and that's it, you know? <laughs> Why don't you break out? Why don't you have a breakthrough? I mean, we talk about these words, but that's what it means. You break into a new world of doing something that you haven't done before that settles you. How about the step of faith to buy a house in Sydney. Whoa. You know, like, my Lord, how many of you have got real estate remorse over life in Sydney? I remember when Chris and I were looking at a house. Our first house we purchased in Sydney was $135,000. And we thought that was enormous because we'd lived in New Zealand where our first house cost us $23,000. I know you laugh, but it was a big house. And, uh, well, it was reasonable. And uh, we got the fridge thrown in. And so then we came here, and we, we actually owned two houses. We bought that one, sold it, bought another one, uh, built a new one. And then we came over here, and all the houses were in excess of 100000 We just thought, my Lord, this is a, you could buy the Taj Mahal for this, this kind of money. But then uh, we managed to get over that psychology and got ourselves a house for $135,000. Then house prices started going up, and I thought, man, we better keep this turning over and moving or else we're going to get left behind. So I looked at a house and it was $465,000. And most houses are around about three fifty. dollars That's like, oh man, that'd stretch it. But you know what stopped me? Let me tell you what stopped me. Because I was ready to have a go, but I thought, oh, what will people think? I'm a pastor, you know, they're going critical already, you know, so, you know, you know they're dipping in the funds, you know, all that kind of thing. Takes home the offering in the boot of the car, you know, like... <laughs> By the way, that doesn't happen. It goes in a safe. I have no idea where the safe is. I still don't know. I think they got one under the deacon. Oh, I better not tell you, you know. 
I, no, I certainly don't know the combination. I don't sign any checks. I don't know what happens. And Emma Darkey looks after it all. She does a great job, and I'm happy. Amen. So I just let you know that you know. But but uh, there was there's always this nervousness because you're a sitting duck. You're, you're a target, just an easy target. And critics are gonna. And so oh, you know, I went, I went and looked at that house. I felt like oh, I should, I should. And then after a while, I just you know. We, did, we didn't. I went to look at a house for rent at Ingleside. And I thought, oh, same thought, because it was like $130 a week. And I thought, oh, you know, most houses are around about, you know, 55 or 70. And we're going to move up from this, this salubrious fibro beach house to this, I'm being sarcastic, to this, you know, this other one. And I thought, oh, well, people, you know, that nervousness, it's not courage, it's just timidity. And, uh, and so I went and I thought, I'm just going to ask that couple in church, come and have a look at this. They were the most conservative couple I could think of in the church. I said, come and have a look at this house. I'm thinking of renting it. What would you think if I rented this house? They said, pastor, you deserve the best. You should go for it. You should live in this place. This is awesome. And they, they were so blessed. They lived way out somewhere. They sold their house and came and lived in a caravan, that couple, in Narrabeen Park, so they could come to this church. They were so into it. And uh, they just got blessed that there was somebody prepared to have a go. But I needed friends to encourage me in my walk of faith sometimes. And all of us need that. That's why being together in the community of faith is so important. And it needs to be a community of faith, not a community of complaining, not a community of criticism, not a community of doubt, not a community of small thinkers, not a community of backward goers, not a community of people living outside the zone of big thinking. We need to be a community of faith, people. Not just faith in an innocuous, milksop sort of way where it describes some kind of Christian adherence. I'm talking about aggressive, take the ground, faith people who are going to possess the land in Jesus' name. That's, that's what it needs to be. So we go from where we are secure into what is insecure. Think of Peter when he sees Jesus walking on the water and he says, can I do that? And for the life of me, as far as I've studied the Bible, I cannot find any deep meaning in why Peter wanted to do that, other than it looked like fun. I'm sorry for all the people who think, oh, he wanted to get closer to Jesus. Please. Jesus was like five foot away. He could just wait a couple seconds and he'd be right in the boat. It's like, why? What, how did it benefit anybody? What High meaning is attributed to this. I know this is a little troubling for some. It's almost as troubling as turning water into wine at a wedding. Who really is benefited by walking on the water? I mean, is that justification? Do we always have to have high meanings and deep meanings to everything? No, sometimes Jesus is happy for you to just have fun and enjoy your life no matter how it comes your way. He says, yes, yeah, Peter, just come out here. So Peter comes out here. What we've ended up with is an enormous preaching message and lesson in faith about how to walk on water, keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus. Because if you keep looking at your circumstances, you're going to find that you will drown. And this is so important because the Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author, he starts faith, and the finisher, the completer or the perfecter. So he keeps working on your faith to keep it perfected. So get your eyes off your problem, stop focusing on it, and start looking at the risen Son of God, risen into the heavens, seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And so you've got to understand that Jesus says, I don't want you to look at the facts. Acknowledge them, but I want you to move to truth because there is a big difference between facts and truth. Maybe your facts are that things aren't so great in your family but the truth is, God has said, I will bless you and all your household. You've got to live by the truth of the Word of God. Listen to me. Faith is not denial. It's not saying it doesn't exist. Faith doesn't go, oh, it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. It does exist. You've got a problem. But you know a higher law than the law of gravity. The law of aerodynamics overcomes the law of gravity. You've got a higher law than facts in your life. You've got truth. And you can let truth shape your facts. As long as you keep your eyes on Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, 
you will find faith is coming into your spirit. Faith is going to come into your soul. And, and every one of us get distracted. We look down at the waves. We go, oh, this is so bad. We look at the wind. We think it's so powerful. How are we ever going to do this? But if you lift up your eyes today and say, I can do this. Jesus, I can do this. I can keep walking. I am not going to go under. I am not going to get suffocated. I'm not going to drown. I'm going to keep my eyes on you. I'm going to keep on walking and taking steps of faith. I'm going to keep on walking by faith, giving glory to God. And that, I tell you, that is, how, that is how you're going to keep yourself walking by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says we walk by faith, not by sight. And to do that, you've got to start this walk that Abraham made. And he went from one place to another in this walk of faith, and he got better at it and better at it. When he first was told by God to, to walk out of Ur of the Chaldees, they worshipped the moon god, whose name unusually was Sin, S-I-N. They worshipped, they were, it was a, he was an idol worshipper. He grew up as a worshipping the false gods, and then God met him started speaking to him and says, I want you to leave all this. I want you to walk out. Leave your father and your mother and your family, and I want you to walk out. Well, actually, he didn't. He, his whole family went up to Haran, just up the road, who also worshipped the same moon god. And there were the same idol worshippers. And, and he went up there and waited until his father died, which was a number of years. And over that period of time, he started building up resources, and collecting all kinds of wealth. And eventually he moved on to a place called Shechem, which was the first place he came to in his promised land, the land that God had showed him. He said, this is the land. And there he built an altar. And it says he called on God. And then he went down to another place called Bethel. And he built an altar there and called on God. And he pitched his tent and built altars. And he kept his faith strong. Every time he built an altar, it was an altar that was giving glory to God because he had arrived in his land. They met a famine in the land, and he made a big mistake. He went down into Egypt, which he was told not to do. But he ended up going down there, and they got an Egyptian handmaid called Hagar. And then, because the promise was taking so long, between, between the time it was given, when he was 75, and now he's nearly 100, and he says to his wife, or his wife says to him, maybe, maybe God is going to fulfill this promise about us having a baby through the handmaid. Because my womb, has, it has no life in it anymore. And Abraham looked at his body and he says, well, I'm as good as dead as well. So maybe you're right. Maybe we'll do it. And they did. And they ended up with a situation that wasn't the God situation. It was them trying to help God out. And God said, no, this isn't the way I was going to do it. I've got, I said, I'm going to give you a child by Sarah. Even though it's taking a long time, keep walking because the promise is coming. And I wanted to say to you this morning, don't give up. Faith gets up again. Even when you've been knocked down, faith might take a few knocks. You might have lost a few battles, but you haven't lost the war. You're still here. You're still in church. Your walk of faith brought you into the house of God this morning. There are thousands who didn't make it, but you did. You are in the house. You started praying this morning. That's faith. That's another step of faith. You gave tithes. You read the Bible. You're listening to preaching. You're saying amen to some of the best preaching you've ever heard. You are on fire. You've got faith in your heart. You've got faith in your spirit. You've got faith in your soul. And I want to tell you how you keep that faith alive. In Romans 4.18, it says, Who? Abraham. Contrary to hope, in hope, believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body. Now, some translations, you might be reading one, that says he considered his own body. So they're very different, the translations. He considered not his own body. He considered his own body. Both are correct. Either way you translate it. Because even though he considered the facts, he did not let them overwhelm his, his faith. Faith is not denial. It doesn't say it doesn't exist. Faith accepts. My body's as good as dead. 
But I'm not going to acknowledge that as being my guiding rule because I've got truth as a higher level to live by. So not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Okay, I want to show you how to, how to strengthen your faith. You get strong by as you walk this walk of faith, you give praise. Okay, so your strength of faith is depending on your mouth. Your strength of faith is depending on you praising God every day of your life. Like we did here this morning, praising God. Grace crashes over me. I know, X Factor. Uh, <laughs> run over and over and over. You'll be singing that song this week. The reason we repeat them sometimes is so that it drills in to our spirit life and we find that song singing itself in our sleep. It is not just for singing here. It's for you to walk by faith every day. Faith isn't just about believing. It's about being a certain kind of person. It's not just turning up here and getting happy. And saying, Woo, that was a good service. I'll go back to my miserable life now. <laughs> go back to your joyful life. Go back to your your miserable circumstances and get joyous in spite of them. The, the Christian life is the great in spite of religion. But please, the scripture here, this is one of the most difficult scriptures in the world. I just need a little drink. It's only water. Um, what? Does God read the Bible? He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. That's what, it, that's what Paul is saying. He's saying Abraham did not stagger at the promise of God through unbelief. Paul, do you know Genesis at all? Abraham wanders off down into Egypt, tells lies about his wife, tells lies about all sorts of things and then brings trouble on the kingdom down there and they kick him out and prosper him and he comes back blessed. He's got Hagar and then he does the deal with Hagar and they've got Ishmael, which has had implications for centuries. The impact of it we feel all around the world today. No, he didn't stagger it. Promise of God through unbelief. No mistakes with him. What? You know when your kids... You know, when your kids do wrong, I mean, when somebody else's kids do wrong, oh, those little brats, you know, but when your kids, they do wrong, oh, yeah, you're okay. Just come over here. It's like, your child, my child, what? Well, your child, you know, you're going to tell them in private, but you're going to defend them. That's what a father, what a parent does. Your father in heaven defends you against every accusation even against legitimate mistakes that you've made. You might have made some real messes in your life, but God's on your side. That didn't disqualify you from the love of God. That didn't stop Him calling you righteous. That didn't stop Him believing in you. That didn't stop Him thinking you're a better person than this. I've got your future self in mind, and so I'm taking you through stuff today that's going to make you into this future you. You're a better person than you are today. He didn't stagger at the promise of God through unbelief. I, I mean, I mean, it's, it's just staggering that, that he didn't stagger at the promise of God's realm. But was strong in faith. How did he get strong in faith? He continually gave praise to God. And being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. That's the point, people. That, that he considered that God had made a promise but that not that he just made the promise, but that he was able. He had the power to take a 100-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman whose womb was way past the age of childbearing and actually create a baby inside that womb that would become Isaac. His name is Laughter. Why would you name him Laughter? Can you imagine at 90 years old, the day the doctor says, ooh, positive, 
<laughs> you're going to go, what? <laughs> you're laughing. You go home and you tell Abraham, and he's laughing. But they knew it was going to be that because for years, they had lived under changed names. God had said, you'll no longer be Abraham, call him Abraham. You'll no longer be Sarah, I call her Sarah, which means mother of a multitude, father of a multitude, princess of a great king. And so they'd be walking around their backyard saying, Abraham, Abraham, it's time for dinner. Father of a multitude, father of a multitude, it's time for dinner. All right, princess of a multitude, princess of a multitude, I'm coming. The neighbors are looking over the fence. Oh, that poor old senile couple. (laughs) They really wanted children so bad. And now they're just calling each other fathers and mothers. Listen to me. You got to call yourself what you are in the future. You got to start believing that your friend and your family are the people who they are in their future. Your future self is a very different person to the one who's here today. And I don't care if you're 100 years old. You might be 50, 60, 70, 80. You are not too old to start changing your thinking about your future self, about your future destiny. You do not disqualify yourself by saying, it's too late, I'm too old. You're not too old. You're not too late. You've still got time. If you're breathing in this room, you've still got time to make a difference in your life and in the lives of this world and in the lives of people all around you you. In Jesus' name, we've overcome. Let that spirit of faith get inside of you and get up again. You might have fallen over, but people, it wasn't the world war. It wasn't the end of the world. It wasn't the apocalypse. It was just a little knockover. Come on, you can do it. Get up again, never say, make a covenant with your soul. Say, I'll never do that again. Break that covenant. Start worshiping God today. Start praising Him. And you're going to find that you'll strengthen your faith. This last scripture in Hebrews 6, 12, as the musicians come, says, so don't become lazy, but be imitators of those who inherit the promises through faith and patience. Listen to me, it's one thing. You can take the board away as well. It's one thing. It's one thing to have faith in a moment, to walk out and say, I'm believing, I'm believing right now. But what about tomorrow when it didn't happen? Things didn't quite go the way you wanted it. Oh, I guess God's not with me. You hold on to faith. You hold on to faith even when it still looks impossible. After one year, two years, three years, Abraham, he's trying to keep believing. God, I believe I left the familiar for the unfamiliar. I left the secure for the insecure. I left the known for the unknown. And now I'm out here, God. I've I've finally seen that you've got this land for us. And I build an altar and I start worshiping and praising you for bringing me to this land. But I got to tell you, tick tock, the clock is ticking, God. Sarah's old. I'm old. What's going on? God says, keep believing. Through faith and patience, you'll inherit the promises. But God, as it gets longer, it gets worse. This this isn't something that you can just fix up. It's like, how is it going to happen? I don't know how it's going to happen. God, I I can't see how it's going to happen. Do you want me to help you out, God? He says, no, don't do that. You just keep believing and keep walking. Keep turning up at church. Keep praying. Don't walk away. Don't shrink back. Don't drop out of the race. It's a little tough at times, but it's building you. You're getting stronger in faith every time you take another step, another step, another step. You're getting stronger every day. Don't stop believing just because you've had a couple of discouragements, a couple of knockdowns. Your comeback is going to be better than your first attempt. What's ahead of you is better than what's behind you. The best is yet to come, people. In your life, God has a better future than your past. I want you to stand up and just worship for a little bit. Just start saying His praise. Lift your hands and praise God for all the things that are going on in your world. Get strong in your faith here today. Praise God for the victory. Praise God for the glory. Praise God for His majesty in your heart, over your soul, in your life. Praise God for the touch of God. Praise God for the Holy Spirit. Praise God for His presence in your heart and in your soul. Praise God for the touch of God over your life. Praise God for the blessing of God on your family. Praise God for the touch of heaven 
pouring out, pouring into your life, your spirit, your soul. In Jesus' name, Heavenly Father, we bless you. Oh God, we praise and we worship you. Thank you for the touch of God and the power of heaven pouring out over our soul, over our lives, over our hearts, over our minds. In the name of Jesus, Lord God in heaven and all the earth, we praise you here today. And everybody said, Amen. While I'm just standing here and everybody has their eyes closed.